This morning's scripture reading is another story of Jesus appearing to his disciples after his resurrection. This is according to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 to 48. And if you'd like to, you're welcome to follow along in your bulletins. So let us hear these words. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and Jesus said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. April 2020, the perilous first few weeks of the COVID-19 pandemic were upon us. It was during the time of the stay-at-home order. Folks were very isolated, pre-vaccine, and there was a committee that had usually met for lunch. And this committee that met for lunch had to transition, like many of us had to do, to doing their business and their committee meetings on Zoom. And so the chair of the committee sent out an email with the Zoom link to all who were participating, asking them whether or not they should still eat lunch together on the screen. Perhaps... Or perhaps it might be perceived to be a bit tacky. So another committee member replied all to the email. And she said, we are all so isolated. We are all so apart from one another. I think we should eat lunch together on the screen. Because if not, we're all just going to become ghosts to one another. So there we were on the committee meeting. Sandwiches, salads, peanut butter crackers, eating together. Jesus, perhaps, would have opted for fish. For we walk back into our gospel lesson this morning, and part of what we experience is Jesus sharing back with the disciples, I do not want to be misperceived by any one of you as a ghost. Walk back with me into the story. Following the resurrection, following the Easter miracle, Jesus appears to the disciples and says back to them, peace be with you. The disciples were struggling to believe in it all, and so Jesus offered the disciples in Luke's gospel in a way that was very similar to Thomas in John's gospel, uh, a sight of his hands and feet. Look at my hands, look at my feet. It is me. But the disciples struggled to believe, not for any bad reason necessarily, but because, according to Luke, they were just so overjoyed. They were so amazed. It was all so good to be true that they could not believe that Jesus was embodying it. That's when Jesus decided 
that he was going to share back with the disciples via very odd teaching lesson that he was, in fact, real. He took a piece of broiled perch, a fish, and ate it in front of them. As if to say back to the disciples, I want you to know before I ascend to heaven for good that heaven, the resurrection, came to live in my physical body. And the best way to demonstrate that back to you is to eat this piece of fish. Go forth now, not believing that this resurrection stuff is just ghostly, not believing that it's just some abstract concept, but go forward embodying heaven in your lives. I sense this is a very important teaching from Jesus here. For if you're anything like me or anything like the disciples in this text, from time to time, you too can make heaven out to be this amazing, too-good-to-be-true concept that is not part of this world, almost as though heaven has been otherized from earth. And when we are tempted to do this, we get the embodied piece of heaven a bit wrong. To share back with you this mentality that the disciples had in Luke's gospel that is so often ours, I thought I would share with you two stories. They are both humorous, but they are rather wise about the complications that arise when heaven becomes just some abstract, ethereal concept. The first is a story that uh, Christian author John Ortberg tells. He was the former minister of Menlo Park Presbyterian Church out in California. Tells the story of one Sunday morning, his Christian education director invited all the children forward to the children's message, and the education director was asking the children about heaven. So she asked them, if I were to sell my house and car and give all my money to the church, would that get me into heaven? The children shouted, no. She then said to them, if I were to volunteer to clean the church kitchen every single week, would that get me into heaven? And the children shouted, no. And she said, if I am really, really nice to the animals, will that get me into heaven? And the children shouted, no. And then she said, well, what can get me into heaven? At which point a five-year-old unexpectedly blurted out, well, you gotta be dead. You gotta be dead? Really? Is heaven just some life insurance policy up against death that is a ghostly, abstract quality that will finally kick in whenever we die? I very much doubt it for Jesus in this text in demonstrating heaven embodied to the disciples was probably echoing his earlier teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. When you pray, pray this way, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, on earth embodied as it is in heaven. The second story that I would share to illumine how problematic it is when heaven gets otherized from earth is a story that uh, American Christianity professor Grant Wacker tells. Uh, Wacker is a, um, on faculty at Duke University Divinity School, and he is one of the foremost living scholars on the life of the great evangelist Billy Graham. Once upon a time, Billy Graham, the great crusade evangelist, was uh, preparing for a crusade in a small southern town. And he had been away from his wife, Ruth, for quite some time and wanted to mail her a letter. And so as he was walking along the sidewalk, he bumped into a young teenage boy on a skateboard and asked him for directions to the post office. The young teenage boy gave Graham some directions to the post office, and Billy Graham, of course, used it as an opportunity opportunity, he lowered his voice and said, young man, will you be joining me tonight at First Baptist Church downtown for the revival? I'm going to be telling everyone how to get to heaven. No, responded the teenage boy on the skateboard. I'm not. And Billy Graham inquired, well, why not, young man? 
And he said, how can you argue to me that you can get to heaven when you don't even know your way to the post office? <laughs> and do you know that Billy Graham, narrow salvation uh, theology that he had and doesn't share my theology either, even Billy Graham, the great crusade preacher, shared back then in that moment, it was a wake-up call for him. If heaven did not come to the street, if heaven did not make sense to everyday people on earth, then that was going to be a problem. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A wonderful theologian by the name of Frederick Buchner made this comment about Jesus' unusual move to eat that fish post-resurrection. This was Buechner's comment about the story late in Luke's gospel. He said, mistaken for a ghost, Jesus was communicating back to the disciples that he was more real than they were. And you know, if you fast forward, you get the sense that Jesus' teaching here really did make sense to the disciples. For the proof is in the pudding that this fish-eating moment really worked as a way of instructing them to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. For those same disciples, as Luke would write about in the book of Acts, would go on and be part of the early church and would go on to partner with God to bring a little bit of heaven to earth. And the result, Christianity in the first century spread rapidly and quickly. You know, it's rather interesting when we consider Christianity in the first century, specifically the first century church, specifically many of these disciples who were part of bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth, that if you study first century Christianity, what differentiated the early church from other religions or other religious cults was not the afterlife. Historical scholars, both Christian and non-Christian, will tell you that in the first century, vast majorities of religions as well as cults taught some version of life everlasting, some version of the afterlife. may not have been heaven, but it was something. What distinguished Christianity in the first century was that the afterlife, the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, could be experienced right now. And so what the church did is they partnered with God to bring heaven to earth. Where there was those who were sick, they would cook soup for them in their house churches. When there were those who uh, were handicapped, they would be included in their fellowship. When there were poor amongst them, they would share their possessions. They would forgive one another and pray for one another. And their heaven on earth embodied witness was so credible that many pagans decided to come and be part. Not because they delayed heaven until after death, but rather because they believed in those words that they prayed. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The text perhaps illumines for each one of us the question, what do we know to be true about heaven everlasting? And how might we partner with God to bring that to earth in the here and now? Heaven is described as a place where there are no more tears Every time we connect with someone who is grieving or hurting and bring hope into their life, heaven gets embodied. Heaven is communicated in Scripture as a place of peace. Every time we see strife and conflict and bring peace into that situation, heaven gets embodied. In Scripture, heaven is described as a wedding banquet. Every time we invite and include others, practicing hospitality, opening our hearts and opening our doors and our homes, heaven gets embodied. In the book of Revelation, heaven is described as a place where there is beautiful music. Every time we sing or ring, lifting the spirits of someone else, heaven comes to earth 
it gets embodied. We're told in the book of Revelation that heaven is a place of fairness, a place where there are all nations and races of people. Every time we seek justice, heaven comes to earth. Heaven gets embodied. We're told that heaven is a place of light. Every time we see darkness and bring light into that darkness on earth, heaven gets embodied. Heaven, we're told, is a place of joy in the scripture. Every time we see that which is negative, every time we see that which is sullen, and when we bring joy to that situation, heaven collides with earth. Heaven gets embodied. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. What a shame it would be for heaven just to become some kind of metaphysical concept that kicks in whenever we die. What a shame it would be for heaven to get reduced or minimized to some ethereal, too-good-to-be-true, ghostly concept off in the distance. In our everyday lives on the street and in our service to the community, may we embody heaven on earth in a way that is fish-eatingly real.